Today's message I have entitled A Preview of Prevailing. A Preview of Prevailing. Let me ask that you take your Bibles and turn to chapter 14 of Revelation. The outline also, if you would take that and follow along today, I believe I have a word for you that will be a blessing and also an encouragement to your life today. A preview of prevailing. Now while you're turning to Revelation 14, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the message today. I read a story about an old custodian at a seminary that regularly waited patiently on the students to finish their basketball game before he began to clean up. Well, one day as he was waiting for the students to finish their game, he was reading from the Bible. And uh, one of the students went over to him after they had finished and asked him if he knew uh, or asked him what he was reading. And he said, I'm reading the Revelation. And uh, the young student said, well, do you understand it? And the old custodian said, yes, I understand it. Now that was really interesting to that theological student because he was thinking that it is a difficult book to read, it's a difficult book to understand, and for a, a, an un, or for a theologically uneducated man uh, to understand was pretty amazing to this student, so he just asked this old man, well, what does it mean? And the old man said, it means we win. That's the good news I have for you today. A preview of prevailing. God will prevail over the evil in this world. Amen. Amen. One day John the Baptist was standing by the Jordan River and he pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Friend, listen. Those who follow the Lamb will win. Now with that in mind, I want to give to you a summary of significant tribulation events that I have talked about or mentioned thus far. This is a summary of where we've been in our journey through the Revelation thus far. The tribulation period a period of seven years, it began when the Lord Jesus came in the clouds and caught away or raptured His church. Now that must be followed by the judgment seat of Christ where all believers give an account of themselves and of their lives and they are rewarded because in chapter 4, we get a glimpse into the throne room of God and we see that those who they are there are casting their crowns, their rewards at the feet of God who sits upon the throne. <coughs> then we learn that the Lamb of God, there in the heaven, there in the throne room of God, the only one worthy came and took the scroll, the scroll, and it was the title deed of the earth that the Lord Jesus has redeemed or bought back. And one day he will fully possess. And as he opens up each of those seven seal, seals in that scroll, judgments were released upon the earth. We call them the seal judgments. And then after those seven judgments, those seven seals were broken and the judgment came, then we saw God in grace send out 144,000 Jewish evangelists to preach and to magnify the name of Jesus. One writer called them a flame, flaming evangelist. Another writer called them 144,000 Apostle Paul. But they went forth to preach. They were sealed, you remember, with a mark. It was God's name on their foreheads. It was for the purpose of identification as well as protection. At 
after the 144,000 went forth, another series of judgments were released upon the earth. They are called the trumpet judgments. And they grow in intensity. Then after those judgments, God in grace again sent two witnesses to this earth. And their conduct and their miracles remind us of Moses and Elijah. Those two witnesses were killed. But God raised them from the dead right there in the front of the or in the eyes of all the people around the world. And boy, they were significant and, and uh, very fruitful witnesses for the Lord. Now listen, as we come to the middle of the seven years, three and a half years have already passed. Three and a half years are still to come. Many call the last three and a half the great tribulation. But we learn that the Antichrist who has negotiated a compromise. He's negotiating a peace agreement between the world and the place the world hates, Israel. And the Jewish temple is rebuilt. And again, sacrifices are offered to Jehovah God. But listen, the satanic trio, do you remember them? There was the dragon Satan the beast of the sea, the Antichrist, and the beast from the land, the false prophet, they show their true colors. And the Antichrist goes into the holy place of the temple and he claims himself to be God. Jesus called it the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist, Satan incarnate, now fully entrenched as dictator of a one world government demands to be worshipped. The false prophet has built a statue of Antichrist and placed it there in the temple and anyone who would not bend, anyone who would not bow to the statue would be killed. The false prophet the leader of the one world religious system and the one world economic system marks the people of the Antichrist or the beast. What is he marked them with? A number. When you follow God, you get his name. When you follow Satan, you get a number. It's the number 666. And it was written upon the followers of Satan without the mark. You would live in great persecution. But if you had the mark, you could do business. You could buy and sell in the new world order. But there was a remnant of Jews, remember? That would not bend. They would not bow. And they ran to the hills for cover. But Satan turned his full wrath upon them. Now we come to chapter 14 of Revelation. It's just before the last series of judgments come upon the earth. We call these judgments the vile judgments or the bold judgments. These judgments will usher in the last great battle upon this earth. The battle of Armageddon. And at that time the Lord Jesus will come back to this earth and bring with him all the saints that have gone on to be with him. John, I believe in this chapter, gives us a preview of the victory we will have. The, the preview of, a, of the victory awaiting God's people. That's why I've entitled the message today, The Preview of Prevailing. One day God's people are going to prevail. Friend, if you follow the Lamb, you're going to be a winner. If you follow Satan, you're going to be a loser. And you're going to go to that place prepared for him and his angels. A preview of prevailing. You know, last time I went to a movie, which wasn't too long ago, but I noticed that uh, again that the first 10, 15 minutes seems like an hour. They show previews of upcoming movies. 
And some of them, they might think, that'd be terrible. I wouldn't want to see that. Some of them might say, I, I think I'd like to see that. But finally, I'm getting to the point where just start the movie.
again, John sees all of these people, all the redeemed, these 144,000, he sees them standing with the Lamb in the heavenly Zion. Now, we're not told how they got up there. We assume that it was much like the church. They were caught away. They were raptured there uh, into this place after their work was done. In verses 4 and 5, John tells us the exemplary life that they lived. <clears throat> Let me just go through this real quickly. They are exemplary in their conduct. John says they, they were not defiled by women. They are virgins. That means uh, sexual immorality uh, was not their bent, or at least they, were, they did not yield to the temptation of sexual immorality. Sexual immorality would have been applauded by the beast and the world system, but these did not yield to the temptation. They were exemplary in their conduct. They did not fall to the temptation of sexual immorality. Also, they were exemplary in their consecration. Consecration. Look at this. They followed the Lord wherever He went. They were also exemplary in their calling. Look at this. It says they were redeemed from among men and the first fruits of God and the Lamb. You know what that means? These 144,000 Thousands were the first ones to be converted during the seven year period of time called the tribulation. As the church was taken up, these 144,000 Jews heard the gospel. They were converted and they were especially anointed and sent out. They were the first fruits. The first ones to be saved during the seven year tribulation period. They were exemplary in their calling, also in their conversation. In their mouth, there was no guile. In their mouth was no deceit. That means when they spoke, they spoke truth. And finally, they were exemplary in their character. Did you notice the last part of verse 5? They were without fault. Ooh, what an exemplary crowd this 144,000 is. But look at this, verse 3. John tells us not only were they standing with the Lamb, they were singing a new song. And they sang it before the Lord, before the throne. They sang it before the four living creatures. Do you remember what they represented? They represented all the created order of God. They were around the throne. And do you remember they sang before the, the elders? Do you remember what the elders represented? All the redeemed of God. They're all around. And so they're singing this new song before all the redeemed, before all the created order, and before God Himself, they're singing this new song. But did you notice that this song is unique to the 144,000? Nobody else could learn it. Nobody else could sing it. It was unique to them. This is what I'm thinking. Their purpose was to defy the beast. Expose the false prophet for who he really was. And to promote Jesus as Messiah. And as they were raptured, as they were taken into heaven, they went celebrating and singing this new song. I don't know what the song was. It's not mine to know. I'm not supposed to know this song. But I do know this. I'm, to, I'm supposed to have a song. Do you have a song? <coughs> See, I believe that one of the great problems with modern Christians today is we've lost our song. We've allowed Satan to replace our song with criticism and complaining and bitterness. Friend, I want to say to you today that if you're constantly complaining and criticizing and you're constantly bitter, you better refine or recapture your song. You ought to have a song. A.W. Tozer said, After the sacred scriptures, the next best companion for the soul is a good hymnal. Are you singing songs? Are you singing the songs to Jesus? I read about a man that once complained to the minister following the service.
service. I don't like the songs you chose today. And the minister replied, that's okay. We weren't singing them to you. <laughs> you have my permission to say that, Brother Van, if somebody complains about what you choose. Pray, <laughs> listen, we're singing them to Jesus. And we ought to have a song. And we ought to sing it to Jesus. Oh, preacher, what have I got to sing about? I'll tell you what you've got to sing about. You're redeemed. You're on the winning side. And if you can't sing about that, something's wrong. There's a new song. Second thing we see here, the Lord gives to us in this preview, is not only a new song, but a new messenger. Look at verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Listen, friend, this is the first time we find an angel preaching the gospel. To this point, the preaching of the gospel has been entrusted to the redeemed man of the earth. John now tells us that an angel has the everlasting gospel to preach upon this earth. The word gospel means good news. I think the good news is twofold here especially. The first part of the good news is Jesus saves and the second part is there's still time. We may at this point be living in the 12th hour, 55 or 59 minutes and 30 seconds. Only 30 seconds perhaps of time left. Time is running out, but there's still time as this angel goes forth with the gospel. Isn't God good? He's a God of grace. But notice something in verse 7. The angel talks about giving God the glory. And he talks about worshiping Him who made the heavens and the earth. Did you know that when you give God the glory, that's the ultimate proof you've been converted? And did you know when you worship God, that's the ultimate action of a converted person? So here's what I believe the message of this angel is really all about. Repent and be converted. And when you repent and you're converted, you will give God glory and worship. <coughs> you know what's amazing to me in this book of Revelation is this. Man is so bent on rebellion against God that the greater his punishment, the deeper his rebellion. You would think that with all that's going on, man would bow his knee and cry out to God. But that's not the case. The case is the greater and harsher the judgment, the greater the rebellion. In the 16th chapter, God is dropping 135 pound hail storm, stones upon the earth. And the scripture says that those who survive will stick their heads out from the rocks and curse God. That's the way it will be. Man had rather curse God than repent. <coughs> With the angels going forth preaching, repent and be converted. I read about a young minister who was seeing his congregation dozing off to sleep as he was preaching and he thought to himself, you know, I must be a little dull. I've got to find a way to get my congregation back. And so he devised this plan. He was preaching. The usual thing happened. And he said this. I live, I live with a woman for 17 years that was not my wife. Boy, that perked up the crowd. <laughs> and then he said, it was my mother. <laughs> this visiting minister was in the congregation. He liked it. 
He thought, I'm going to go try that on my ground. So the next Sunday, he's back in his pulpit, and his crowd dozing off too. And so he says, I've lived with a woman for 17 years who was not my wife. But then he hesitated. He forgot the punchline. <laughs> and after this awkward moment of silence, he said, but for the life of me, I can't remember her name. <laughs> Listen, we've got a new messenger here. The angel's going forth to preach. And he's going forth to preach. Acts 3.19, repent, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Friend, when you do that, you will indeed give God glory and worship. Here's a third thing that we're going to receive in this, in this wonderful prevailing uh, that we find here is a new destiny, chapters 8 and 9, 8 through 11. It's not the kind of destiny that appeals to us, but it's here. Verse 8, and another angel followed. Or followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead and on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Six different angels can be seen in this, in this chapter. One just preached the gospel. This second one, according to verse 8, comes forth and shouts, Babylon is fallen. What in the world does that mean? The word by Babylon right there is very important. That's God's name for the world system of the beast. And you need to know that now to understand Revelation. Babylon is God's name for the world system of the beast. Okay? And it is suggested that the angel says it is fallen twice because of the fallen religious system described in chapter 17 and the fallen political and economic and religious system that will fall in chapter 18. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now listen to this. The old city of Babylon was built in a place described in Genesis 15 and we know it is the Tower of Babel. There was a man by the name of Nimrod who uh, attempted to have the first one world government and one world religion. God told Noah and his family in Genesis 9-1, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But you know what the people did? In pride, they stayed together. And they spoke the same language. It made them feel more powerful to be great in number and to be great in their communication. But God came and He destroyed their tower. He confused their languages and the people scattered because of the confusion. Everyone went with their own clan because of the confusion of the languages. All the clans now spoke a different language. Babel became Babylon. And did you know the old Babylon and Babel is geographically known today as Baghdad, Iraq. Babylon is hated by the Jews because they destroyed the crown jewel of Jewish life, the temple. They also hate Babylon because the Babylonians kept them in captivity for 70 years. And then the Jewish people gave Rome the name of Babylon because they hated Rome and the Roman oppression of Jesus' day. Doesn't it seem right then that God would use the word Babylon 
to name the world system of the beast. The Jews hated it so much. And as John was writing from the island of Patmos to a predominantly Jewish church or the Jewish background in the church, he knew that that, that word, Babylon, would bring a real understanding to what he was saying. Now look at verse 8b. Babylon is fallen and is fallen, that great city. Why? Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's the reason that Babylon failed. This satanic system called Babylon led the people to commit spiritual idolatry, spiritual fornication. It's called idolatry. They worship the beast. And then John tells us the destiny, this new destiny of all those who worship the beast. Did you see that in verses 9 through 11? This third angel comes and he says to all who take the mark, all who worship the beast, two things are going to happen. First of all, they're going to drink the wine of God's wrath. You know wine ages and becomes full strength. John uses that analogy here. God's wrath will be aged by the time of the tribulation and it will be poured out, John says it right here, in full strength. Also it says they will go to their new destiny, torment that ascends forever and ever. They will have no rest day or night. Friend, listen to me. This is an unpardonable sin. If anyone takes the mark, there is no hope. And it has been said, the saddest word in the English language is the word hopeless. For those who take the mark, there is no hope. You know what these verses remind us of? Where it talks about torment and smoke, and it talks about no relief day and night. You know what that reminds us of? It reminds us of the place, the real place Jesus talked about. The place of hell. Did you know Jesus taught more about hell than anybody else? Do you know why? He doesn't want anyone to go there. He doesn't want anyone to go to that place. When in North Carolina, the evangelist of old Vance Haber was beginning his ministry, and he pastored first of all a little country church. And a, little, and a farmer out there in, in that little church didn't like the sermons that Vance Havner was preaching on hell. And so he said to, to Vance Havner, uh, why don't you preach about the meek and lowly Jesus? And Havner replied, well, that's where I got my information about hell. Nobody talked about hell more than Jesus. Jesus warned about it, talked about it. Nobody talked about it more than him. He doesn't want us to go there. Isn't it good to know that in our day and time and culture, we still got hope? Friend, there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And the answer is still Jesus, thank the Lord. There's a new destiny. You don't want to go there. Number four, a new blessing. Lou, I love these verses, verses 12 to 13. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith. You get, are you keeping the faith? Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. That passage is familiar to you. This passage is often used at a funeral for a faithful Christian. You focus on verse 13. It gives three exciting things about this new blessing we call heaven. The first thing that I see there is rejoicing. Did you notice this beatitude you find in verse 13? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Do you know what that word blessed means? It means happy. Happy, rejoicing. That's it. There in this place of blessing, there will be great rejoicing. Blessed are the 
the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Also, there's going to be resting. Did you notice that in the second part? That they may rest from their labors. Are you tired? Are you tired? There's going to be resting. What a blessing that will be. And then the final is the reward. Look at this. And their works follow them. All the deeds done to the glory of God accrue interest in the lives and hearts of others, <coughs> even when we're gone. Friend, listen, our works don't get us to heaven. Our works follow us to heaven. You remember the story of Stephen, the first deacon? They stoned him to death. And while they were stoning him to death, he looked toward the heavens and he saw the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Now, in all the other pictures of Jesus, He is sitting. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. But when Stephen gave his life, the Lord Jesus stood. That says something to me, doesn't it say something to you? As we give our lives, as we do our works, it is those things that we do that will follow us in to heaven. I read about a man and his wife who were very faithful to the Lord Jesus. The wife got sick first and passed away about a year later. The husband passed away. When he got up to heaven, the first one to greet him was his wife. And she said, it's so beautiful up here. I've got to show you around. And so she began to show him down the streets of gold. She began to show him all the wonderful places to live, all the buildings, all the wonderful things that God had in heaven. And finally they came back to the wonderful golden gate. And the lady asked her husband, well, what did you think about it? He said, it is so beautiful. And if you hadn't made me eat all that old brand cereal, I would have been here a lot earlier. <laughs> Isn't this going to be a blessing when we get up there to our new blessing, a place of rejoicing, a place of resting, and a place of reward? Oh, I can't wait. Well, the fifth and final thing I must hurry is there's going to be a new day. We find that in the last part of this chapter. John gives us a preview to what we're going to call, or what is called, the, the Battle of Armageddon. Look at this scripture. Then I looked and behold a white cloud. And on that cloud, one sat. Now in my Bible, the word one there is capitalized. Why? Because it speaks of the Lord Jesus. The one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Rust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come to you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Look at this. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. Oh, he had a sharp sickle. Another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire and he cried out with a loud cry to him who, uh, who uh, had the sharp sickle saying, thrust your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust the sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and this is what he did with it. He threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the wine press up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Again, he's giving us a preview to the Battle of Armageddon. The images here are very clear. They anticipate the greatest battle in all of history. There's three things that I noticed. I noticed the reaper, the ripeness, and the rapidity. The reaper, there are two reapers here. They are simultaneous. 
but they speak of two different harvests. You know what this does? It takes us back to Mark, Matthew chapter 13 and the parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus spoke of a harvest of good seed, which represent his children. And he also spoke of the tares, the bad seed, which represents Satan. And the bad seed were discovered when the harvest was gathered. Here in Revelation, we know that this Revelation text is speaking of two different harvests because one is of wheat, the other is of grapes. Two different reapers, two different harvests, simultaneous. Verse 14 pictures Jesus. Verse 15, there's the fourth angel who comes forth. And notice he comes forth from the temple. He comes forth from the house of God and he says to the Lord, throw in your sickle, thrust in your sickle and reap. Verse 16 describes what he's reaping. He's reaping the good seed. He's reaping his children. This is all the ones who were saved during the tribulation period and have not yet made their way up to heaven. And then in the next part we find another reaper it's an angel okay he comes from the temple also and he says to a sixth angel and the sixth angel comes from the altar this angel says to the other angel you thrust in that sharp sickle i think it's significant that one of these angels come from the altar i think it's the altar of incense did you know the altar of incense is where they prayed that's where the prayers would go up into the nostrils of God. Do you remember what the martyrs were praying earlier in Revelation? They were proud. They were praying. They were asking, God, "How long will you be before you avenge our death?" I think their prayers are now answered. The time of waiting is over. Fire. So you've got the reapers. Then you've got the ripeness. The angel says in chapter fifteen, verse B, or the second part of verse fifteen, the harvest is ripe. In verse 18b, the angel says of the wicked harvest, the clusters of grapes on the earth are too ripe. You see, it's just the right time now. Things are now complete. Destruction of evil has had its day. But now, everything is ripe for the harvest. You know, friend, there's a harvest to come, and God knows when everything's going to be right. We don't know, but God knows. And when it's right, the reaper will come. And then the last thing, the rapidity. Did you notice it's just one skilled blow? Just one skilled blow of the sickle, and God's judgment is done. And boy, what kind of judgment it is. It's signified or symbolized here by what John writes in the last part of verse 20. And the wine press was trampled outside the city, and he pictures blood flowing out. Not the grape juice, but blood flowing out. And it's so deep, it's as deep as a horse's bridle, and it's 1,600 furlongs. What in the world does that mean? Well, friend, just as the grapes are squeezed and the juice comes out, God's wrath is going to bring blood to lost humanity. And in this image that John gives us, he sees a river of blood. And according to this, to put in our own present day vernacular or a different way, it's 200 miles long. And it's deep enough to touch the bridle of the horse. Is that literal? I don't think so. I think John is trying to teach us something about the final judgment of God. It is going to be swift and it's going to be infinite. He's going to take care of business for the last time. It will be a new day. Evil will be defeated. Jesus is going to win. I want to be on his side, don't you? <laughs> I don't want to be on that old loser side, see? I want to be on the winner's side. And that's Jesus. This is just a preview. This is just a preview of prevailing. This is a preview of our victory that's going to come. And we're going to see it unfold over these next several weeks. I'll close with this. A visitor went to an insane asylum. 
And as he was being shown around, he saw an inmate sitting in a chair, pretty content, but he kept saying to himself, Lulu, Lulu, Lulu. The visitor asked the guy, well, what's the matter with him? And the guy said, Lulu was the woman that jilted him. Well, he was taken on through the asylum, and he came to another man. This man was in a padded cell, and this man wasn't sitting contented. He was beating his head against the wall, but he was crying out, Lulu! 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 And the visitor asked the guy, Guy, now what's that man crying out that for? And the guy said, He's the fellow that Lulu married. <laughs> you know, I read that and I thought, the jilted man, the jilted man had won the victory, but didn't even know it. It's the same with you and me. It may seem like today that we're not going to win, but I'm going to tell you something. We're going to win because Jesus is the winner. Here's the way Paul put it. Listen to it. Thanks be unto God who is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for just a glimpse now of the victory to come. We know that because of Jesus, we're going to prevail over sin, death, grave, evil in this world and live with our Lord Jesus forever and forever. We thank you for that victory that we have in him. Sometimes, Father, in these days, it seems like the battle's lost. Seems like we're not going to win. Seems like Satan's got a very strong hand and he's on a long leash. Father, may we understand that the Bible is true and the Bible is sure. We get a glimpse, we've got a glimpse already of the victory that is ours. May we claim it in the Lord Jesus Christ. May we understand in Him there is life. And there is life in no other but Him. Move in this place, Father, and draw us close to Jesus. Give assurance to the saved. Bring conviction of sin to the lost. Touch our lives now as we go into the invitation. In Jesus' name, I pray. Now heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're going to stand and sing. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, we invite you to give your heart and life to Christ. Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants to be your Savior. He doesn't want you to go to that place that He's prepared for Satan and his angels. He doesn't want you to be an intruder there. He wants you to go to heaven to be with Him. He wants you to miss all this terrible tribulation and drama. You want to miss it. If the Lord should come back today, if the Lord should take you home today, you want to be able to say and know without a doubt that you're going to go to be with Jesus forever and forever. Don't follow that old loser, Satan. Follow the winner, Jesus. In Him, there's everlasting life. Give your heart and life to Him today. I'll be here at the front to help you with that if you'll come. Maybe you want to come and join the church from another church, or maybe you want to come to this altar and pray. You let the Lord speak to your heart right now. Let's stand and sing.